My name's Michael Johnson. And we're on Texas death row. I'm 29. I'm here for capital murder. The condemned man is Michael Dwayne Johnson. My execution date's tomorrow. In 24 hours, Johnson will be put to death for his role in the murder of a man named Jeff Wetterman. Jeff was 6'7". He was a big guy, and he was just full of life. He had a great spirit, a big smile, and just a, a huge personality. He was, you know, just a gentle giant. He was the largest of the three brothers, but he was the most humorous and probably the most compassionate. Jeff Wetterman's family has been waiting 11 years for justice. Now they will be making the trip to witness Michael Johnson's execution. I'm going to go to Huntsville, and hopefully we'll go in, and Michael Johnson will be put to death, and we'll all walk out of there OK. Well, we're just going down to a motel room to wait for my son to be executed, or as I like to say, murdered. <laughs> I mean, that's the way I feel about it. I don't think people have the right to take life, even the state. It's, they're just as guilty as the people they're killing. And since Michael had proof that he didn't do it, they're guiltier. That's all. The Johnson family believes that Michael is innocent, but can they prove it in time to save his life? We always have hope. Nothing is certain until it's done. Nothing. God works miracles. Our state should be embarrassed that we're executing someone without giving them a fair trial. Defense attorney Greg White will spend the next 24 hours working on emergency appeals to stay the execution. And so we have papers sitting at the United States Supreme Court waiting to be decided. We have a petition for executive clemency waiting for Governor Perry to make a decision. And, you know, we are alert to anything that might happen. People every day that face the death penalty profess their innocence to the end, even in the face of overwhelming odds. Mike Freeman helped prosecute Michael Johnson. He has no doubt the state got it right. There was never any doubt. The evidence was overwhelmingly convincing that this dastardly deed was done by Michael Johnson. Jeff is late for work at his father's gas station, the Lorena Fast Time. Michael Johnson and a friend are joyriding down the freeway in a stolen Cadillac, their gas tank running on empty. Now, what was your emergency? You came my work at the Lorena Fast Time in Lorena, Texas, and the kid that was stopping me has just been shot by somebody that came up here and got gas and drove over. That's what he Rob you? No, ma'am, he just said got gas, and I think they just took off with the gas. Oh my God. Jeff was the type of individual that if, if someone came in and they, they needed a tank of gas and they had no money, he'd have given it to them. Okay, it was the person black or white? It was a white young man with blonde hair. I didn't get a good look at him. Was he by himself? No, man, there was somebody driving him. He got out and shot him. What does the car look like? What color? A description of the car and the suspects hit the airwaves statewide. Within 24 hours, police got a tip from a confidential informant on the outskirts of Dallas. Two individuals had been talking about committing a crime fitting the description of the one that had occurred in Lorena. The names of these two individuals were Mike and David, was the only thing the informant knew. But he did give their street that they lived on. Police follow the lead to the 5200 block of Edgeworth Drive. They find the stolen Cadillac parked in a lot on the corner. Down the block, they find the front door of Michael Johnson. I have my headphones on in my room, and my dad came into the police room. They're looking for you, Brian. Johnson flat told me that he hadn't been anywhere, you know, for the last few days. He'd been staying at his house and never left. The same day, police put the color on the second suspect, 17-year-old David Vest. Vest, uh, complete opposite end of the spectrum from Johnson. As we're walking out the house with him, he's already trying to tell us what happened. David Vest gave up a detailed statement, pointing the finger at Michael Johnson. He told me that uh, he was celebrating his birthday, 
that Johnson had suggested that they go to the coast in the stolen Cadillac that they had possession of. When they got to the south side of Waco, they realized they didn't have any gas, and they had about $4 between them. Johnson and Vest pulled into this drive and pulled up to the far end of these pumps. Vest got out of the car, pumped the gas. The last thing in the world they expected was for someone working in the convenience store to come outside and just engage them in conversation. Vest said what was going through his mind was, what are we going to do to steal this gas? You know, this is a pretty big guy. And when Vest finishes pumping the gas, he hangs the nozzle up, and Johnson shoots Wetterman in the face. Vest said he was as shocked as anybody. He didn't realize he was going to do that. Vest cut a deal with the state, eight years for aggravated robbery, in exchange for his testimony against Michael Johnson. David Vest wasn't the only one talking. Friends of Johnson and Vest testified that Johnson had bragged about committing the murder. Michael Johnson told them that he had shot a man in the head and a gas station attendant and that he dropped like a rock. And he laughed about it. He thought it was funny. At trial, Johnson kept his mouth shut. His defense maintained he never even made the road trip with David Vest. Yeah, well, that was my lawyers. They come up with this alibi saying I wasn't even there. And so they put it on. But then at the end, they kind of changed it and started talking about, well, even if he was there, it couldn't have happened this way. And that just, and they were right that it couldn't have happened the way they were saying. But it just made everything, made us look like we were full of shit, so it did. DNA linked Johnson to the stolen Cadillac. And surveillance video showed Vest and Johnson together on the road on the day of the murder. They got him in the car. They got him videotaped down in different areas. He was there. There's no doubt about it. Sheila Roberson was one of 12 called upon to decide Michael Johnson's fate. No doubt it's a horrible decision to make, but that was our job to do, and, and, and we were given that job, and we had to follow through. And I had never given capital punishment a thought before. That was the last thing that I had ever, before this happened to me. But I feel like, you know, Michael Johnson chose to do this. After 11 years of waiting, it now appears that Michael Johnson's last breath is only 24 hours away. Yeah. I mean, it sucks. I'd rather not do it, but yeah, I'm ready. But the condemned man still has one card left to play. On the eve of execution, he is claiming that David Vest is the real killer. And Johnson's lawyer says he has proof. I knowingly caused bodily injury to Jeff Wetterman by shooting him with a handgun. Signed, David Noel Vest. A confession by Vest? Signed in the presence of the prosecutor and the judge? I don't believe we ever seen this. Roberson is right. The jury didn't see it. Why not? It looks like at this point that, that he will be executed at 6 o'clock tomorrow night. He is not guilty of what he's charged with. He is not guilty of the things that give rise to the death penalty. There's no different light to take this in. The crux of White's case is this piece of paper. There's his name. I'm pleading guilty. I am guilty. It's a confession brought to light by a friend to the condemned. My name is Ward Larkin. I'm just unconditionally opposed to capital punishment. That's how I've gotten involved with getting to know guys on death row. Larkin got to know Michael Johnson and began actively investigating his case. So I went up to Waco and looked through his case files and his co-defendant's case file, and that's when I found the co-defendant's confession. Larkin discovered David Vest's signature on the document that has called Michael Johnson's case into question. This is a sworn confession, he says right in it. I shot Jeffrey Michael Wetterman. At first glance, Vest's confession appears to support Michael Johnson's claim of innocence, but it was never entered into evidence at Johnson's trial. And not only was it a confession, it was one that was sworn to, had an official file mark on it, had the judge's signature on it. There was no question but that it was authentic and that it had been sponsored by and written by the district attorney's office. Prosecutor Mike Freeman says the confession is not what White claims. According to Freeman, state law compelled Vest to confess to all aspects of the crime, even though he didn't pull the trigger. And we in the legal world realize that that is just a technicality, that it was 
pleading him as a party to the offense, not the uh, shooter. My honest feeling is desperation. Larkin is a man on a mission. He has traveled 500 miles in search of David Vest. After knocking on several doors in town, Larkin finally gets a lead on the whereabouts of David Vest and confronts him one-on-one. -on -one. All I want you to do is tell the truth. That's all I want. Truth was he killed that man. Yeah, but you confessed. You signed a confession. To what? That you shot him. No, I never Yes, shot you him. did. <laughs> I have seen the confession. You signed a confession. Vest says he never knowingly no, confessed to murder, and he's not about to start now. Well, dude, Michael Johnson killed that man. I watched him with my own eyes. He okay. did it, and he didn't care about anybody else or nothing. He went back to Dallas, Texas, and he bragged to about 15, 20 people and told all of them that he did it, and he was proud well, of it. Okay. He did it, man. I don't know if you know him personally. Yeah, sure, I know him personally. If you knew him before? No, I didn't know him before. Oh, you didn't know him before? No. He I've known him. crazy, wild, and didn't care about nobody or nothing. On the day before the execution, Michael Johnson's friend comes away with nothing. Yet on that same day, Greg White is also at work, drafting one new and final appeal to save Johnson's life. There is an argument circulating that the protocol for the lethal injection either is cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment, or that it may violate the Texas Constitution, which prohibits torture. The prohibition of torture kind of embodies the idea that there's unnecessary pain. Arguments similar to this have worked to stay executions in other cases around the country. 11 years have come and gone since the murder of Jeff Wetterman. Now the stage is set for this tragedy's final scene. At 2.45 a.m., prison guards found Michael Johnson in a pool of blood, dead by his own hand. Shock. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to think. It really just shows the type of coward he was. He didn't want to face you again. There, there have been reports, and, and we have confirmed that, yes, there was a message that he had scrawled in blood on the wall. According to several reports, Johnson's last statement, written in his own blood, was, I didn't do it. I think it's honorable. I think there is no reason for him to allow somebody to murder him for no good reason. And if they are not going to let an innocent man go, then he wasn't going to give them the satisfaction of murdering him. <laughs>